Hi loves, and welcome to the With Love Always podcast, a podcast to help you live the life you were created for. We are your hosts and your friends, Bree and Marissa, and we're so grateful you're here. We pray you listen and leave feeling more inspired, encouraged, and uplifted. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode. For today's episode, we are doing something a little fun, a little different, and a little lighthearted. We're doing a Q&A episode, so we are so excited for you guys to dive into deeper friendship with us and for us to answer some questions. We asked you guys over on our Instagram, on our personal Instagrams, to leave us some questions that you guys were craving to hear from us on this podcast episode today and we just invited you guys to ask anything at all whether it was personal about us individually about us together as a unit experiences story times advice whatever it may be and you guys for sure delivered all the goodness in the questions that you guys asked so we selected about 10 questions that we're going to try to get through today some of them kind of overlapped between what People asked Marissa what people asked me, so we are so excited to dive into them today, and hopefully, just like I shared, you guys are invited into deeper friendship with us and get to know us a little bit better, so let's just jump right on into the questions. Okay, question number one is, what is one non-negotiable you have in your daily routine? Do you want to go first? I actually want you to go first. <laughs> okay, I'm, I feel like this might be a little bit boring, but what came to mind was just sleep. Mm. Like, I have to get a certain amount of sleep every single day. I guess, is that part of my daily routine? I guess part of my daily habits. Yeah, I would say prioritizing your rest. That's yeah. very important. <laughs> <laughs> I need like nine hours of sleep. <laughs> I need a lot of sleep, but I just feel like in order to function and feel my best, that is key. Like mm. I can't do the rest of my routine in my day or my work well if I don't have that foundation. Mm. So I would just say rest is so important. So just kind of boundaries around that. Boundary. Save an episode <laughs> on that. Favorite word. <laughs> Our favorite word. That's such a good one. I would say I'm very similar, but it's funny because my optimal amount of sleep is actually seven hours. Oh, no. I am like, I'm so jealous of that. Yeah, it's so funny. Sometimes when I sleep eight, I like don't feel as rested as I do when I sleep seven. It's mm. very interesting. I've learned that about myself actually probably within the past year. Like, that is my true true number that I need seven hours of sleep so it's it's interesting but I would say for me let me think my one non-negotiable for the day honestly for me it's working out like I just I've been this way for so many years but I feel so energized when I work out in the morning when I don't work out in the morning given like I'm not working out seven days a week so it's not like every single day. But I would say like during my week, just prioritizing moving my body before my whole day gets started. Oh my gosh. It energizes me so, so, so much. It makes me feel really good. And honestly, gives me like clarity of mind to do all the things I need to do, whether it's like showing up as a friend or doing my job well, or being creative. It just like gives me the endorphins I need and it honors my body. So I would say for me, working out. Do you always work out in the morning? I do. I really struggle to work out in the evening. Mm -hmm. I feel like honestly, after 3 p.m., I I genuinely admire people who work out in the evening, like after work. I am so depleted by the end of the day, but maybe it's because I've trained my body to expect movement Mm -hmm. at the beginning of the day Mm -hmm. that if I had to work out in the evenings or like anytime after 3, 4 (gasps) p.m., I struggle. Oh my gosh. My body's like, why are you doing this to me? I think at the end of the day, my body wants to wind down and maybe like go on an evening walk. But in the morning, I'm like, okay, let's hit it. So yeah. That's impressive. I wish I could wake up and like do a workout, but I'm more of like a lunch or evening workout. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. (laughs) I'll do like morning walks, but I can't really do like cardio in the morning. I feel Mm. like I'm still waking up. I think my mind is more active at night. Like, I think you're probably more of like a true morning person. And I really, even though I go to bed early, I feel like the most energized, the most Mm. clear as far as like thoughts and stuff at night. I'm like, I'm finally awake. (laughs) That's so funny. 
It's also on that though, I think I had a moment where I feel like I'm weirdly both a morning person and I can kind of be a night owl. You're just a day person. I'm just like, I'm an all the time person. <laughs> because That's good. if I, like on the weekends, I mean, during the weekdays, I try to go to bed early because I like my optimal sleep and I like to rise early. Mm-hmm. On the weekends, oh my gosh, I throw that out the door. And then I'm like staying up so late for no reason. And I don't even know what I'm doing sometimes. I just think my mind also can be very active. So anyways, those are non negotiable You've been all day, girly. I've been all day. I like never want to sleep. No, I love sleep. I yeah. love falling asleep. Oh, it's the best. Um, okay, next question is advice on longer term relationship breakup. Marissa, I'm going to pass this off to you to answer first, and then I'll, I'll share some of my thoughts. Okay, first thing, I just want to empathize with whoever wrote this, and I'm sure there are like a handful of girls listening that, and guys, you never know, mm-hmm. that are in this place, and it is just one of the most painful things. So I'm so sorry if you're going through this or you've been through this, but I'm just going to speak from personal experience because I'm really not an expert on this, and I've only ever date at one person in my life and it's my husband but we did have a period I think it was about like two years into dating where we did break up and it was very much like a mutual breakup but still very painful because I genuinely didn't think we were ever going to get back together like that was not on my horizon at all come to find out my husband knew all along so he was like in denial he's like I'm just convinced we're like soulmates so we're obviously going to end up back together but anyways, I I think the first couple of days I was like just processing. I think that's normal. But I remember going home to visit my parents and I just was like sobbing for probably a couple of days. And my mom was just like, Marissa, I've never seen you like this. This is so weird. Like I thought you felt good about the breakup. But I just wanted to highlight that because I think even if you have like a peaceful or like end on a good note kind of breakup and you feel like it was the right thing, it is so painful. And I really think you kind of need to grieve it like you lost that person. Mm -hmm. Like my mom literally said, it seems like he died. And I was like, honestly, that's how it feels. It really is a death to love in a way. And it's a death to kind of the friendship and just these like great memories but so I would say number one just feel all the feelings Uh, give yourself grace and just time to process understand that that takes time and it's such a healing journey I also think you're so vulnerable in that state so I'd really just surround yourself with an abundance of love because I really Mm -hmm. feel like when you're in a long-term relationship, I'm assuming it was love. So you're giving like half of your heart to somebody else. And so when that ends, you kind of feel this like gape within your heart where it's just wounded. And I think you really need like love and just a safe environment to kind of put those pieces back together. Mm. And I think it can be tempting to just kind of like instantly insert it with something else. So I would just say be like very careful that there's going to be this new amount of time that comes from like the loss of the relationship um, and just kind of like time and energy that you used to dedicate to that person. So just fill that time very intentionally and fill it with things that are really life-giving because I think that will kind of help. I think if you just once you're like past the grieving period, if you just sit there and are kind of like always thinking about the relationship and always missing it, that's going to be hard. But if you can start like a new hobby, even like pursuing new friendships or just spending more time with people in your life that you love, I think that can kind of give you something new in your life to look forward to. But Mm. I know you might want to mention something as well. Well, I think that was such good advice. And I feel like you can speak into that area a little bit more than myself. I haven't really gone through a breakup that was like devastating to me. And so everything I share is not necessarily from like direct experience of what I've walked through, but I have like held friends who've walked through those experiences. And I do have like my own, you know, wisdom that's not from experience, but just from what I would hope I would do if I were to walk through that. 
But I would say first and foremost, just as just to echo what Marissa shared, give yourself the space to grieve and to process and to confront whatever reason why you decided to break up with this person in the first place. Because ultimately, if a severance of this relationship is happening, there is a reason that it's happening, whether it's on your behalf or their behalf, or it's mutually that you guys are deciding to break up. Like there is a reason big enough to cause the separation. And so though that's so painful, I think the number one thing that we as humans try and tend to do is like we dismiss and we ignore and we suppress. Mm -hmm. And I would just say, do not suppress anything. Like literally as painful as it is, Make that reason so at the forefront of your mind that you are actually incapable of forgetting that reason because Mm -hmm. I think that actually allows you the ability to heal when you are not fixated in an unhealthy way, but fixated in a beautiful, healthy way of the reason why you're choosing to walk away from this relationship. I think it also, to what Marissa said, gives you permission to begin filling your time with something else that is actually life giving in a way that the reason why you guys broke up isn't. And I hope that makes sense because like I said, that's not an experience I've gone through. It's not a pain or a grief I've gone through, but witnessing friends that I cherish so closely embark on that journey of healing, witnessing secondhand the way that they kept reminding themselves all the reasons why they didn't need to turn back to this person or they didn't Mm -hmm. need to seek communication with this person or validation with this person given every single scenario is so different. I mean, Marissa's story is so different. There is a time and place where that may be necessary. But in this very moment, when you can just fixate your eyes on knowing and trusting and believing that you breaking up with this person is for the betterment of your good and the betterment of your future and that person's future separately, I think it just allows you to remember that you are temporarily breaking your own heart now to restore your heart better in the future. You're temporarily breaking the other person's heart now or they're breaking your heart now on behalf of who may actually be your husband or who may actually be your wife in the future. And so if you can just fixate your mind on that of if you think this person is so, so, so good, but there's things big enough that is causing you to walk away, imagine how much the future prosperity of your future relationship will be because you chose to walk away from something that was just good in anticipation for something that could be really, really great. So that, keep your mind fixated on that because I just believing in abundance ahead and not allowing this breakup to cause so much hurt that you grow really discouraged in love Mm -hmm. or discouraged in dating, I would say is a really big thing. Yeah, you have to have that hope towards the future. Like, yeah, I think once you've processed that in a healthy way, just reminding yourself and honestly, whether even if the relationship wasn't great, like there was something there that kept you, you know, together for so long. Mm. So imagine those good things. You're going to feel that so much stronger with somebody in the future. Like you truly just need to remember and believe that there is a better love that's out there for you and it's worth the pain you're feeling in this moment. Mm. And just keep, yeah, just remain hopeful in a season where it's really easy to just kind of turn away and feel despair or feel like I'm never going to feel that way again because you definitely will. Yes. And that, like Marissa said, that will only be amplified and magnified with the right person or in the right timing or whatever it may be. And going back to kind of what I was saying and something that I've said to other friends and even have said to myself in applying to different areas of my life when I've encountered grief is you have two paths. Both paths are hard. So choose your hard. You are right now either going to break up or have broken up with this person and it's hard and you're grieving and you're in pain, but you're choosing the hard now in order to experience the good and abundant later in the belief that better is available for you or the choosing your hard is enduring a relationship that you feel halfway in or endure a relationship in which there's this hurt or there's this thing that's really big and keep continuing because you are afraid of the breakup but then long term you're actually only hurting your heart more so it's like choose your hard do you rather endure the hard now 
and go through the healing and go through the pain and go through the processing and go through the loss of this person in your life? Or would you rather allow more time to pass and for the hard to only be magnified more later if you were to break up with this person six months from now or a year from now or 10 years from now, you know? So Mm -hmm. fixate your mind on the hard that you are choosing, which is breaking up in this in, re- in relation to this question and just know that the hard is only temporary temporary and the good is to come question number three is how do you become confident speaking about your faith Bree? this is like <laughs> your sweet spot you are so confident speaking about your faith mm-hmm. i feel like you'll just meet a stranger and you're somehow talking about god right oh. away I love it. Well, thank you so much. I literally, uh, it fires me up so much in the best way. I think for me, my confidence, I almost feel like I can't even perfectly put it into words and maybe I'm not meant to, but I think my confidence just comes simply first and foremost from the joy that I feel on the day to day of just my faith in God. Like it fills me up so much. I, I feel like my identity feels so secure My hope feels so secure. My joy feels so secure. And these are all things that we have, I mean, different episodes on as well. But so much of my being is so secure and rooted that I think I don't really have space in my life to actually worry about what people think of me. And that's not to say I don't worry about what people think of me. I definitely do. Time to time, I'm a very human But I I genuinely believe that because my identity feels so secure in God, my joy feels so secure in God, so much my life purpose, who I am, my presence in the room, it's so rooted in things that are so outside of myself that when I go to talk to someone, I genuinely don't feel the fear of being misunderstood because when I'm leading with so much love, like even if faith is not something they share with me even if you who's listening if faith is not something you share with me it's like i just literally want to love you so much and so intentionally and so genuinely and when i'm leading in love there's just no fear that can come between me and you and me wanting to share something that's so important to me and me wanting to extend that love and invitation to you and i also think about it this way it's like when i'm talking to someone what someone thinks of me like is actually the least important thing in that moment for Mm -hmm. me the most important thing is that person is like how is this person feeling in my presence are they feeling seen are they feeling loved are they feeling cherished are they feeling like my attention is on them And that is my greatest pursuit in a conversation with a stranger, with a friend, whoever it is. And when that is my focus and when that is my motive, like I think naturally God kind of comes up because that's just an overflow of who I am. But when I'm so fixated on how I can meet and love and be a friend to this other person, I honestly don't have room to worry about oh, are they going to misunderstand me if I talk about God or if I bring this up or whatever it may be. It's like, me and my intention in bringing up God and my faith is because I love this person so much. And it's so not about me that I don't ever want to miss the opportunity to love someone in that way just because I'm so concerned about what they'll think of me. It's Mm -hmm. like, no, I want to show them how worthy they are and how, you know, valued their presence is in this moment that, I don't know, I just, I I feel like I never question it. I'm like, I'm just going to go there. I'm going to share it. And it's okay if it's not understood. It's okay if it's not a shared value. Like I said, it's okay if you who listening, this maybe isn't a shared value of yours, but it's like, I just love you so much. And I think when that motive and that intention can be felt, God is always received in conversations, at least in in my experience. Like, yeah, yeah, I think that's such a good point. I think it can be scary because we're worried that, oh my gosh, am I going to offend somebody? But yeah. there's never been a time, like if you are, first of all, delivering good news and you are loving somebody and you're joy-filled, like somebody could talk to me about anything. Mm-hmm. And if they were doing it with love, I would just be such a listener. I would mm-hmm. be all ears. And so I think that's like what's so beautiful about your approach and what I feel like we're called to do in sharing this good news and sharing our faith is just speak with like the impact it's had on our life where it's these personal 
experiences, it's a relationship we have that makes us feel seen, but it also makes the other person feel seen and loved. So if you're just there to serve that person, they might not always receive it exactly in the way we hope. We still could be misunderstood, but people do know what the feeling of love and sincere joy and being cared for is. Mm -hmm. And they will see that beyond the words you say or beyond if you mess up or anything like that. Um, they'll just feel that your heart is sincere and that you really care for them. A hundred percent. And also, I think when we can just accept that in this world, we will be misunderstood and not allow that to be something that paralyzes us, whether it's talking about your faith or talking about your dreams or talking about any area of your life. Like people are going to misunderstand us. But the moment that we can accept that, we don't need other people's approval or other people's understanding of us to be all that we are. We don't need that validation from other people, not to, not in a dismissive way, but in a way that you are just so secure of who you are, independent of what anyone else has to say. When you are allowing that to take the lead in your life, the fear of being mis misunderstood, at least speaking on behalf of myself, is just thrown out the window. I'm like, please misunderstand me. Because I know I may misunderstand you, not because I want to, but we're just two different humans, you know? And so I, I don't know. I think, yeah, in summary, just leading with so much love and allowing that to be your confidence and that to be your motive and that to be your intention. It's like people can feel your love no matter if they understand or if they don't. So. And it gets easier too. I feel like the first couple of times I even remember like being in high school and I'm like, I'm talking about my faith like I'm a weirdo. What, what is this? But then it just, it honestly gets so much easier. And now I feel like being in our mid-20s, we're like, we'll talk about anything. Like yeah. it just, I don't know. People aren't as scary as you real re like think they are to go there. I feel like people actually really like talking about deep things. Yes. So I'm like, just open up that conversation and just see what their thoughts like. If they want to push back, like just invite them into that conversation and try to learn from them and their perspective. I think it can be really special. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. I think is more Brie Brie focused. Um, but how has dating been in LA? How has it been? <laughs> Honestly, it's so funny because I feel like when I moved to LA, I mean, right off the bat, people are like, dating, dating in LA is the worst thing ever. Like, it's so hard. It's so tough. It can be so superficial. And while I'm confident that some of those statements could be true. I'm also equally as confident that some of those statements could be true anywhere mm -hmm. <laughs> in the world. Being in your 20s and trying to navigate navigate dating, especially with online dating being such a thing nowadays, I think we can lose some of the in-person integrity that so many of us still crave. But I would say for myself, like, not that I've dated that that much since being in LA but I've gone on a pretty fair amount of dates <laughs> and I would genuinely say like dating in LA has been such a great experience for myself like I have felt so honored by like all the men that have chosen to pursue me I mean I really have had really wonderful dating experiences if if anything like above and beyond and though none of them like transpired into a relationship, I have just really enjoyed all the people that I've had the opportunity to meet through dating. And so I would say for myself, it's been a really positive experience. But I will also say, similar to like how people dog on like dating in LA is the worst, it is at the end of the day, like it's who you were attracting at the end of the day. I've said mm -hmm. that like three times in a row. Um, because for myself, like I do have a standard in dating and a standard of, you know, values and the type of pursuit I desire and the expectation with intentionality and types of dates I'll go on and communication. I, I hold myself up very highly that I don't think I give men who maybe could dishonor me in dating access to me and mm -hmm. so I think that naturally kind of barricades me from like bad dating experiences because I am walking in so much wisdom in that and I am also upholding my values and my standards that I don't give just this hot guy 
on the LA streets an opportunity to take me on a date, even if he's so hot, so handsome, so whatever, because I don't care about that at the end of the day. Like his character has to, to reveal itself. His communication has to reveal itself. His pursuit of me has to reveal itself because I'm not the kind of girl who's just going to go and hang out. Like you're going to ask me on a date. So all that's to say, I think for myself, I'm attracting quality dating experiences because I'm upholding myself to a standard that I'm like, my heart and perspective is honestly in pursuit of my husband and in desire of my husband, that those are the kind of caliber of dates that I'm going on. And yeah, I feel like dating and relationships and boundaries is actually something that I I personally got a lot of questions about when we like asked questions on our stories. So I do want to dive more deeply into that of like dating and boundaries and all that sort of stuff because I have so much to say as the half that is single on this podcast. Um, But yeah, I can dive into that more in another episode. The one little thing I'll add (laughs) from my like outside perspective I just watching you on dates or talking about guys, I do feel like I like dating is hard. I don't want to like dismiss that. I, I see it with like friends that it can be really challenging, but I think you have such a healthy perspective with dating. And although like those dates haven't really led to like a boyfriend or anything like that, I think that's part of why you've enjoyed it because you've really come into the dating where you're just trying to get to know somebody, get to know their heart and their character, and you're not placing these expectations or letting Mm -hmm. yourself even be disappointed because I think it would be easy like you meet these guys and you're like, they're so great. I'm so bummed that like they're not my boyfriend. I'm so bummed that like I haven't found my husband yet. But you're just there to receive and show up. And I think that's really hard to do. Like, I think you do it really well. But Mm -hmm. I just, like, can't even imagine if I was in your shoes. I think that would be so difficult. But I think just despite, like, even if you go on a bad date or even if it's a great date, having hope and having a good perspective that your sights are set on your husband, it's going to be so worth it. Mm -hmm. And you just need to, yeah, set your own boundaries, protect yourself, but also be open and be open to receive and not placing those, like, instant expectations. I think you do guard your heart where you're trying to get to know them, but you're not, like falling for these guys right away so I think it can keep you safe I agree so much last thing I will say on that because I so 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 agree that's not to say dating hasn't been discouraging I think there are I mean definitely there are moments because like I cannot wait to meet my husband there are moments where I'm like oh god what the heck like (laughs) where is he but to what Marissa said and I like I said I want to do a whole episode over dating but Ultimately, when I go on dates, my metric of success with going on dates and dating someone is not just the outcome of a relationship. I think so often when we like view dating through the lens of the greatest outcome or the greatest goal is a relationship, that's when we have a metric that is literally setting us up to feel disappointed. But for myself, it's like the honor of getting to to meet different men and going out on dates with these different men who have shown me a part a heart and a pursuit that I haven't experienced before. It's like, that is the greatest reward for me that even when it doesn't work out and even when we choose to go our separate ways, the fact that I got the opportunity to know the heart of a different man who offered different masculine energy towards me and who showed me a glimpse of what I really appreciate in a pursuit. Oh my gosh. I'm so like, so thankful for that. And I take that and just continue forward in my search for not my search in my, I don't even want to say waiting either, but in anticipation for my husband. So I think it's also perspective on dating in my metric of success when it comes to dating. I know that was kind of a long answer, but I have a lot to say. (laughs) So that's how dating has been. It's been good. Okay, next question is kind of a fun one on the topic of love. What are our love languages? Do you want me to answer first or do you want to answer first? You should go. (laughs) I'll go. Um, So I think for me, the ones that I give and the ones that I receive are actually different. Yeah, that's a good way to to note it. Sometimes I I think we lump them together, but I kind of think mine might be the same. Yeah, and I also believe that mine in friendships and 
dating is different as well. Mm. It's like different dependent on the type of relationship. I would say the one that is the same that I both give and receive is quality time. Like I just, I really love quality time when like someone just wants to spend time with just me. Uh, I love quality time. It makes me feel so, so, so loved. I would say the one, the number one that I give is words of affirmation. I'm such a words girl. Like, and it just, it flows so naturally for me. I think that I feel when I'm showing my love towards someone, it's like, I just want to tell them whether it's like encouraging someone or giving advice or whatever it may be to just get to speak words of life over someone. It is actually my favorite thing. I love showing love in that way. I would say the thing is though for words of affirmation like I do crave it. I love to receive it back towards me, but I don't think I necessarily need it that much in friendships actually. Mm, that's I, interesting. I've noticed that in myself of like I'm so fine and aware if like I'm the one who's you know encouraging or affirming, but I don't feel disconnected with someone if they're not able to give that back to me. But I do believe and do know about myself like when it comes to the person that I enter a relationship with and ultimately the man that I'm choosing to marry. Oh my gosh, do I need a man that can give me words of affirmation back? Because I think that is the one relationship in my life in which I need to be encouraged and I need to be like filled back in that way. Whereas Mm -hmm. in my friendships, I don't feel like I need that as much. That makes sense. I am trying to think of what mine are. I think for receiving love, I would say actually acts of service. Mm. I think this has changed. So I think I used to always be like quality time and words, but Mm. as I've gotten older, I don't know what it is, but I just feel so honored to have somebody serve me, especially like in a husband capacity. And I think that was the way my dad always showed love. So I don't know if that plays into it as well, but I would say I show it more through words and quality time. Mm -hmm. And I feel like just in general, somebody, I just need people in my life that are very careful with their words and they're very intentional and I don't need a lot. I just Mm -hmm. need like to fully trust. Like even I feel like my husband isn't really like a super wordsy person but when he does speak it's so it'll be even in like random moments but it's so honest it's so sincere and like it's something you can really hold on to that has a lot of weight and it's kind of like a unique observation and so personal Mm. to your relationship I think when somebody doesn't just give words freely but they give it very intentionally and it's so specific to you Mm. that makes me feel so loved and that's something I try to do as well where I think I'm like a little more reserved with my words but when I say something I really really mean it and Mm. want to encourage and uphold people to that oh my gosh that's so true of you it's so so true it really is I can feel that from you and John her husband it's like so intentional that's so sweet yeah next question is things you can do to focus on yourself in your single girl era so I'm single of course Marissa's married but this is something that we can both answer on because Marissa also had a single girl (laughs) once upon a time pre-husband um I think for myself it's like Something I just, I have so many thoughts on this. And like I said, I would love to do an entire episode on dating, an entire episode on singleness, all of that good stuff. But I think for myself, I mean, it sounds so simple because it is, but I just like to really focus on myself. In this season of being single, I'm not, I mean, yes, I desire a relationship. And yes, I desire to meet my husband. Like I cannot wait for the day, but my entirety of my singleness is not fixated on the prize of when am I going to enter a relationship and when am I going to meet my husband? That's not it at all. It's focusing on what is my purpose in this season? Like how can I so deeply invest into my friendships? How can I so deeply invest into what I feel called to? Like this podcast? How can I so deeply invest on right now in this moment, even without a husband and without children and and even backtrack without a boyfriend? How can I invest 
my time so well into nurturing myself and nurturing my relationship with God that I am actually best preparing myself to be the wife I want to be one day and to be the mother I want to be one day. Because right now I'm addressing different parts of the inner workings of my mind and my heart and my actions to be refined, to be sharpened, to be cared for. So when it does come to the point that I'm a a wife one day and when it does come to the point that I'm a mother one day in my singleness and when I had all this time on my hands, I worked on those parts of myself. I worked on those messy parts of myself. I addressed them. I grew my communication. I discovered what sets my heart on fire. Like, what do I like to fill my time with? What are, what is my hobbies? What does Brie like? What, what does Brie like? What, what are my opinions on things? Like getting so specific with myself has been the number one thing that my singleness has been filled with of, I want to be someone that when I do meet that person in my story, it's like, I know my thoughts on things. I know my opinions on things. I know who I am. I know what lights my heart on fire. I know my talents and I'm just so sure of myself. I don't, not that you have to be, and I know everyone meets their person at such a different age. I think I've had more time than, you know, you, for example, Marissa, where it's like you had the beautiful opportunity to grow into that more with your husband. Whereas like I'm growing this independent of my husband right now. Mm -hmm. But I think I love that I know with confidence one day when I do meet my person, I'm not going to need to look to this person to tell me what I think about things or to tell me what my core values are, to tell me who I am. That will be so established independent of that person. And that will grow once that person comes into my life and they refine me and sharpen me and change my mind about things. But I don't know. I think just gosh, just soak it up. Soak up this time you have to yourself and don't wish away this season. Don't wish away your time. Don't expense your energy and your capacity wishing you were always going on dates or wishing you were in a relationship. Focus on it now because once that season changes, it will, it could never change back again, ever again. Mm-hmm. And I think even speaking to some of my married friends, like I was also at lunch earlier today with a friend who's recently married and she's like, oh my gosh, is it the greatest gift ever? But you don't realize that you don't have that same time to yourself, you Mm -hmm. know? And so just cherish it. Focus on yourself. That sounds so simple, but that's truly what I feel like I'm doing the most in this season. I love that you mentioned that because that's what I tell all of my single friends. And well, number one, it's a season of singleness. Mm -hmm. So like you said, it's not a forever. Mm -hmm. So when you view it in the lens and you trust that you have your person and you're going to get to spend the rest of your life with them and it's so exciting, but enjoy that because it is really limited. And rather than seeing it as a season where you have less than viewing it in a season where you do have more of something, you have more time, you have more energy, more focus. And that is like having an abundance of that is really great because you can direct it towards all of these amazing things. Like you were mentioning, you can direct it towards your passions, new friendships, creativity. Like there's so much opportunity to give more of yourself into these things. And once you become married and then obviously having kids, you just have less of that time. And I think people always look so fondly back on that season of singleness. And so just enjoy it. I know it can be rough because I think a lot of times people just want to know when it's going to be. I genuinely believe it's going to be there quicker and sooner than you even realize. So just enjoy the season, like treat it like a vacation, like just have Mm -hmm. fun and make the most of it because it can change literally tomorrow. You could meet your person and be in a a relationship for the rest of your life. So just truly trying to enjoy it and have fun. Yes. Singleness is a gift. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like this is also a question for you because it's something I struggle with a little bit, but how do you stay motivated to work out? Mm. I think for myself, I will say like working out is something that I have always just had as like a means of release a means of like starting my day like I always did sports in middle school and high school so I think I did have a lot of like patterns that were just developed through the years but I would say as an adult now and in my 20s and kind of navigating 
I think we all have like a journey with navigating with working out and how we're nourishing our bodies and all that sort of stuff. For me, my greatest motive in working out on the day to day is how can I honor my body the best? How can I steward my body the best? How can I allow myself to have optimal energy, optimal creativity, optimal purpose in my life? How can I show up optimally for my friends, for my family, for my coworkers? And for me, that comes with releasing energy that therefore gives me energy through moving my body. And I think something that I tangibly think about a lot is, I mean, our minds and our physical being, everything is so interconnected. I feel the most clarity when I have moved my body and I've exercised. And that clarity spills into every area of my life that I just mentioned. And something that I really cherish is God entrusted me with this body and he entrusted me with this life. And he entrusted me with so many you know, friendships and purposes and passions in this podcast that I want to see God through. And I want to like really honor God so much of God, show me how to optimize my human self to the best of its being. The way we feel about our bodies just on a point blank basis is how we treat everything in our life. So when I'm feeling good in my body, I'm feeling clear in my mind and I'm able to opt- operate optimally. So yeah, just like honoring my body, not in how I need to look or how this is that. And I think that can definitely be the benefit. And I think we all like desire to look and feel our best, but I think fixating on the feeling is what keeps me motivated. I love that. That's such a good perspective. I would say kind of the same thing. Like the moment I viewed it through, I don't have to work out. I get to. Mm -hmm. And also just a reality check as I've gotten older and you have a little more like pains each year. I'm just reminding myself that I will never be like as healthy and as young as I am right now. So I need to Mm -hmm. take advantage of that and also just enjoy it, like enjoy this period of my life and work out in a way that's fun for me. I think it took me a long time to figure out ways that I actually liked working out. There's a lot of ways I do not like working out and moving my body, but there are a few I really enjoy. And then you start to actually look forward to it. I think if you have that mindset of like, oh, this is such a chore, even if you're still doing it, if that like gets you to go to the gym, I would just say to try to like stretch yourself and try something new. Cause I really Mm -hmm. don't think working out should be a chore. I think it's fun and it releases endorphins and it like boosts your mood. So I think it should be something that you genuinely look forward to and that you get to do. And especially when we're like sitting around all day, it just feels good to just move your body and get outside if you can, because it can be really fun. Yeah, I agree. Next one is a fun one. What's your favorite travel destination? So maybe like your favorite trip or place you've ever been. I would say Gosh, I always say this, but my favorite, one of my favorite places is Italy. I love Italy so much. I think I've only been twice now, or not only, I've been twice. I know some people have been, I feel like so many times, but I also know some people haven't been. And the first time I went, I went to the Amalfi Coast and it was stunning. And then the second time I went actually was when I solo traveled Europe which I would actually love to speak more about that at some point on the podcast. But I went to Tuscany, Italy, and it was so captivating. I think I love everything about Italy. I love the food. I love the culture. I love the language. I love the scenery. It's just so beautiful. And I don't know, my personal experiences and memories that I have associated my both separate trips to Italy, I think make it one of my favorites. And then I would say my second favorite is probably Costa Rica. Ooh, I still need to go. It's so magical. I love Costa Rica. I want to go back. My favorite place I've ever been to, it's kind of random, um, but it's Bermuda. And I think it's my favorite because mm. I went there like with one of my best friends and I didn't really have any expectations. I was coming with her on a work trip. And so she just invited me along. You know, that was like never on my bucket list, but it was 
the most beautiful and the most serene place. It's actually like a small island mm. and it's just so peaceful, so scenic and beautiful. The water is completely like crystal clear and so warm. Mm. It's actually a really good honeymoon spot. Like it very much has that romantic feel to it, which it's funny. It was just the two of us. And I just loved it. And then I think second would just be Hawaii, just because that's mm-hmm. where I grew up going on family vacations. So there are so many fun memories there. And I really want to take our kids there one day. And I mean, I just love being by the water. So that's the theme. I went to Italy, but I went to Milan. So I feel like that oh, hardly yeah. even counts. <laughs> yeah, I actually haven't really been to Milan. I went through Milan like on a train, but I never went to the city. But I haven't been to Bermuda or Hawaii, so. You haven't been to Hawaii? No, I've never been. Okay, I want to well, go. Have to go. I know. I literally want to go. You would love it. That's what everyone says. So tropical. It seems so magical. Last question we'll answer, even though we want to answer a million more, is what we actually merged two questions that we got that were very similar. So we'll just read them both. So advice for making friends in college and advice for a college sophomore who can't find people who share similar values. Gosh, this is such a good question. And I know that this can be so hard because I remember specifically thinking back to when I was in college, my freshman year of college, I really did struggle making friends that first year. At least I struggled with finding friends who like really valued friendship for friendship. I think for myself, my experience of my freshman year of college is I was meeting a lot of friends like like socially, like at parties and things like that, because that's is a part of my story. And that is kind of what that my freshman year of college looked like. And I just remember getting to a point where I just felt so empty and just realized like, man, these are friends that I'm doing all these things with, but they don't actually like know me mm-hmm. and they're not actually like listening to me when I'm having a hard day or all these sorts of things. And so. I think specifically to the college girl that might be listening to this, I think first identifying what values you do cherish, like what values are you wanting to experience in another friend? And first and foremost, my greatest encouragement, we actually have a whole episode on friendship, but my greatest encouragement is to first become the friend that you are praying for and to not only become that, but to begin offering that friendship to people. Not that everybody deserves that friendship, but I think when you are showing up as the friend that you want to have, you are likely to bring in the friendships that you want to experience as well. Also just getting really like personal with yourself and identifying like, what are things you love to do like hobbies or is your faith really important to you? Cause I know for myself, like that is what kind of turned my life around in college when I found God and started believing in God and then went to church because that's when I started experiencing friendships that I realized my heart was craving. And so church, of course, was a very natural place that I began meeting a lot of friends. But I think whatever value is so important to you, whether it's, I don't know, like if you like to surf, if you like to play basketball, whatever it is, like whatever your hobby is, going to the places where people are experiencing that and people are participating in that. I think that really is such a beautiful way to meet people who are interested in the same things that you are. Yeah, that's so good. I definitely struggled making friends in college just because I never lived on campus. And I also wasn't super involved. And so I didn't really go to parties and I didn't do any clubs, which I would say I totally recommend like getting involved. I think that's a great way, like just Mm -hmm. saying yes and meeting a bunch of new people. But something that helped me was I think in the beginning, I felt all of this pressure to be friends with everybody I met or be Mm -hmm. friends with everybody in proximity to me. And that just I don't know, it caused this friction where I felt like I had to become somebody else to be friends with this person that I otherwise probably just wouldn't be friends with. So I think once I gave myself that permission to just, you don't have to change yourself, you can just be yourself. And then when I did meet people that really aligned with who I was, what my values were, what I liked doing, I would just pursue that person because it's just kind of like in the pursuit of dating, it's like, 
you meet this person and you really feel like they could be a valuable friend, like go and get their number, invite them to coffee, ask them to study or do a picnic. I think just being very intentional and people are so receptive, especially in college. Everybody is down to meet new people. So Mm -hmm. I think it's just a matter of putting yourself out there and you will find the right people and just give yourself grace in that season and really focus on quality people over quantity. But it will eventually happen. It just kind of takes time and it takes you just kind of extending that that invitation to people if if you're struggling actually meeting people and kind of maintaining those friendships. But yes, I love, love, love that point is you have to be willing to pursue people because I think you know, if you're feeling this way, like a timidness towards making a friend, like other people who are craving good friends are also feeling that way. And so whether you are in college or in your 20s or any stage of your life and you are craving to make new friends, if you meet someone that you feel a connection with and you would like to get to know more of, don't allow that to just be a fleeting encounter. Like ask that person for their number go boldly and ask them if like Marissa said if they want to get coffee or if they want to do dinner or if they want to go on a walk with you and yeah it may be uncomfortable because you're two people that don't know each other yet but I think about a lot of my friendships even my friendships here in LA like a lot of them met on a whim of you know I could either allow this to be one encounter and I just move on or I could actually follow up with this person and go to coffee and try to build a friendship and see if there's compatibility for a friendship. Like, I mean, I think about the way Marissa and I met, like we met through mutual friends, but we met one night on a boat and literally within a couple of days later, we were, we went on a little day trip together and that was what it looked like to be in pursuit of one another. And then fast forward, we literally have a podcast, you know, <laughs> like it wasn't this thing in which we even have this years and years of history. This was us being in pursuit of one another in pursuit of that time to get to know one another and look at where it led us. So you just never know where pursuing someone could lead you and the friendship it could lead you. And I think about, like I said, my friends here in LA, a lot of it was me kind of having to step out of my comfort zone and ask this person if they want to hang out with me even in the fear of maybe they won't want to hang out with me or maybe we'll hang out once and never hang out again. And that's okay too. Like that's just a part of finding your people and not allowing that to discourage you or feel like it disqualifies you. That's just, you're going to be compatible with some people and you're not going to be compatible with others. And that's just part of the process. But yeah, hundred percent. put yourself out there, pursue people like you'd pursue dating like pursue your friendships. Like it is like a date, you know, you're seeing your compatibility. You're seeing if you get along and do you want to spend more time with this person? And do you want to open your heart up to this person? And people will be honored. I am truly so honored anytime somebody pursues me. Mm -hmm. I think it's so hard in college because prior in high school, it's a lot of like proximity friendships. Mm -hmm. So you almost like, I don't remember ever having to try like growing up friends mm-hmm. just kind of show up at your door yeah which that's awesome but especially now like even as you get into your later 20s it only gets more and more challenging mm-hmm. but if you put in that work now where it's like we know what that pursuit looks like we can get past that like awkward stage and just put ourselves out there it's so worth it and it's something you can continue to do so use college it's it's such a learning and like such a trial process and you really have nothing to lose and they will be honored to spend time with you. Yes. So I think those are all the questions we are going to answer today. We, like we shared, would love to answer so many more, but we've already been talking for so long. (laughs) Um, But thank you guys to everyone that submitted a question to us today. We are just so honored that you guys would even want to ask these questions. So we hope that you guys got to know us a little bit more today. So to end today's episode of you guys just getting to know us a little bit better, we wanted to just end on a praise and just invite you guys in to hear something I know I'm praising in my life recently. I shared in our previous episode that I have been in between living situations. I recently moved out of my last place. I broke my lease. It's been 
quite the journey. And as of this past week, I just celebrated not only finding my dream spot, but also moving in and your girl officially lives alone now, which I'm so excited for this next <laughs> chapter of living alone. This is my first time ever living alone and it's only been a week and I love it. And so such a praise God showed up for me in the middle and in the midst of feeling so, so, so discouraged. So cannot thank God enough for how he worked that all out. And I also want to mention as I celebrate this praise, I want to thank all of you guys who actually reached out to me personally on my own personal Instagram and mentioned that you had been praying for me or just rejoiced in me after you saw that I moved into a new space and mentioned that you knew that I was going through this because you were listening to the podcast. That meant the world to me. So thank you guys for loving me in that way. But yeah, that's my biggest praise lately. I'm so excited to come see it and to help you decorate. <laughs> so good. I can't wait. I need all your help. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. We pray this episode was encouraging and life-giving. If you found it valuable, please share it with a friend, leave a review, and subscribe. And be sure to follow us along over on Instagram at With Love Always Podcast. Signing off with all of our love always, Bree and Marissa.